federal government have started the year badly, we look closely at whether the Prime Minister can come back from her latest difficulties. Plus, we speak to Mark McGowan, the man with the job of trying to topple the Barnett government. It's a new year, and we were promised that we would see a new Tony Abbott this year. But unfortunately, we've just seen a, re a rehash in his National Press Club address of the same negativity, government bashing, and no new ideas. It was Groundhog Day for Dr No. Welcome back to 2012. This is Showdown. That was Bill Shorten, newly promoted Cabinet Minister, being negative about Tony Abbott's decision to go on being negative in 2012. It looks like it's more of the same this year flowing over from last year. On the program, as mentioned off the top, we'll be first speaking to Mark McGowan. Now, he's the new man in WA that has been charged with what's probably one of the most difficult jobs for the Labor Party around the country. Western Australia is an incredibly conservative state at the best of times for Labor, much less the worst of times, which is right now, where you've got a Labor government at a federal level that are doing things like a mining tax, a carbon tax, holding only three of 15 seats in the parliament uh, at a federal level through Western Australia. Now, Mark McGowan, as the state leader of the WA Labor Party, is going to be trying to topple a Liberal government on the rise. He's had a pretty good start so far, a blunder from Barnett. We'll talk to him about that. We'll also try to find a little bit more about him in the course of this program. In addition to that, we'll be speaking to Warren Mundine, well-known Aboriginal leader and also former president of the Labor Party, given some of the events that have been happening with the Aboriginal Tent Embassy in, par in the Parliament precinct, as well as with the ongoing controversy surrounding the Prime Minister and Tony Abbott. will be interested to get some of his thoughts on that, including his latest thoughts on what happened with Tony Abbott's National Press Club speech today, where he pledged that he would be spending a week each year in a remote Aboriginal community were he to become Prime Minister. I'd be interested to know what Mr Mundine's thoughts are are about that. And finally, to wrap up the program, Shadow Assistant Treasurer Bill Shorten's opposite, formerly Matthias Corman. I spoke to him a little bit earlier about not so much just the cut and thrust of what's going on at a state or indeed a federal level, but rather the global economy. At the end of the day, Australia is not immune from what's going on in China, Greece, Italy, even the downturn in the United States. I seek the Shadow Assistant Treasurer's views on just how much of an impact he thinks it could or will have on the Australian economy. All that coming up on Showdown, but first let's take a look at what's making news with Michael Willisey. Welcome back. You're watching Showdown. Well, if you think Julia Gillard's got a tough job, and that she does, an even tougher job is the job of the new Labor leader out of Western Australia, Mark McGowan. He's taken over in the kind of bloodless coup that, quite frankly, federal Labor could learn a thing or two about. Uh, Eric Ripper stepped aside. He was struggling in the polls. He did so graciously and gratefully, I think, in the end. And Labor has this new leader, Mark McGowan, and we've got him coming out of the Sky Perth studios now. Mr McGowan, thanks for your company. Thanks, Peter. Now, I obviously know you well from, from WA, having lived there as the Education Minister in the previous Labor government, and I dare say most West Australians would obviously know you well as well. But for Australians around the rest of the country, um, what is it that you think you can do or that you can bring to the table uh, to help Labor out in what is probably its most difficult state at the moment? Uh, well, I'd summarise it as energy, vitality, ideas, uh, and a desire to do things differently. Uh, I realise that we're in a poor position in the polls. Uh, it's never been worse, to be honest. Uh, we are the underdogs. Uh, so what I'm going to do is do a lot of things differently to what's been done in the past. Uh, I think my caucus is happy with that approach. And uh, hopefully West Australians will see that we present a good uh, alternative, a positive alternative, uh, to the Barnett government. Why do it now, though? I mean, I, I ask this, this is sort of one of those strategy questions you don't normally get into in the short-form interviews, but at the end of the day, you've been touted uh, as, as a bit of a rising star for some time. Yourself and Ben White have been talked about as, as future leaders for some time. Uh, in a sense, though, you're coming in now at a time where, sure, your party might need you and, and Eric Ripple was struggling in the polls, but at a personal level, you're young, uh, time is on your side. Uh, the risk that you've got here is that you come in at the worst possible moment for you personally uh, and you get burnt up as so often happens to opposition leaders? Well, that's a depressing analysis of the situation, Peter. <laughs> I wish you'd told me that a week ago. Um, the truth of the matter is I wanted to do it. Uh, I want to serve in government. I want to serve the state. I want to serve my party. I want to serve the parliament. Uh, and uh, uh, it's an opportunity, and you don't uh, pass up opportunities like this. It's a great opportunity. To be the alternative Premier of Western Australia is a wonderful thing. To be the Premier of Western Australia is even better. Uh, but I'm not going to pass up an opportunity to 
can't go forward with a positive set of policies for people in this state and to lead a team that I think will have the energy to take on the government. Well, on that issue, I mean, it was fascinating the way, for, for viewers around the country, the way that Colin Barnett became Premier was was odd to say the least. He wasn't even the leader. Uh, a Liberal had been pre-selected in his seat. He was leaving Parliament. He'd announced his retirement. He'd all but written a book which uh, continues to not be in the public domain, but uh, the draft of it, we all believe, uh, had him offering some fairly frank thoughts uh, on his now colleagues that he leads. Uh, yet all of a sudden, Troy Buswell falls on his sword after the chair-sniffing saga and so forth. Alan Carpenter calls an early election, uh, which probably hurt him a little bit in his reputation with people. And at the end of all of that, suddenly you guys find yourself on the wrong side of the Treasury benches when you looked like you were guaranteed another four years. So do you still have the personnel and the confidence there, I guess, uh, to be able to come back? It's amazing how quickly things change. Well, there's no rule that says you have to win an election. Um, there's plenty of examples around the country where... Governments have lost and oppositions have won when they weren't expected to. We're in that category. I don't ever think that we were a sure thing. And I always thought the environment in this state, uh, some of the events that had taken place, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the dynamics in this state made it difficult for us to win. So I never ever thought we were a sure thing and there's no rule that says you have to be. Uh, we still have lots of people from government with experience. We have new people who have come into the parliament uh, with enthusiasm and youth. Uh, I, hope, I like to think I'm sort of in the middle of that. I've been in the parliament 15 years. I'm still relatively young. I like to think that I've got the experience of having been a minister in a range of portfolios, plus long experience in the parliament, plus experience of a life before parliament, uh, and uh, a lot of energy to boot. So I hope... Uh, that people see that and a positive platform put forward for the election. What about having to deal with the conservative nature of WA as a state and particularly in the current climate where you've got a federal Labor Party where, let's be honest, the federal Labor Party is making things tough for the state Labor Party in Western Australia. Things like the mining tax, the carbon tax, whatever your ideological view, they are far less popular, in my opinion, in the West than uh, comparatively in other parts of the country. Well, Kim Beasley always used to tell me uh, that you, it needed a miracle uh, for Labor to win in Western Australia, yet we do regularly. Uh, Jeff Gallup led us to two great, great election victories. Alan, led us, Alan Carpenter led us nearly to an election victory, a few seats away from it. So there is, uh, I think, a lot of support for Labor in Western Australia, particularly if we offer that positive alternative. Uh, in the case of uh, the federal government, it is true. Uh, the results of the last federal election were far below the results state Labor received. So uh, it, it has to be said uh, that um, we all need to lift our performance in this state, and I think the federal uh, party certainly needs to do that as well as us. But what about on the issues? I mean, where do you stand on things like the mining tax, uh, the carbon tax and these sort of issues, which whilst they are federal issues, uh, they have a pretty significant impact at a state level as well, particularly the mining tax? Happy to answer that. Uh, look, the mining tax is passed in the federal parliament. I don't think anyone seriously believes that Tony Abbott would roll it back and therefore present an 11 or so billion dollar hole in his budget, particularly when the major players who are paying the tax agreed to pay it. So I doubt it will be rolled back, but in any event, my aim is to secure for Western Australia the share of the infrastructure fund provided by that mining tax that we put in. We put in 50, 60, 70 per cent of the, uh, the proceeds of that tax. There is a multi-billion dollar infrastructure fund uh, for funding ports, roads, electricity and so forth. My view is it should be returned to the states according to their contribution. That's what I'll be arguing with the federal government. That's what I'll be arguing with Mr Abbott if he forms federal government. That's what I've been saying to the state government. That's what we want to get. Now in relation to the carbon tax, again, it's passed, it's in place, it'll be very difficult to roll back. Uh, you might not know, but the Premier is on record numerous times as supporting an emissions trading scheme that naturally, as any economist will tell you, requires a price on carbon. So I'm not exactly sure that there's much difference between the Premier of Western Australia and the federal government uh, in relation to that issue. You've experienced your own version uh, of uh, skullduggery by the other side uh, against you since you took over the leadership. Not that dissimilar, quite frankly, uh, to some of the skullduggery that went on out of Julia Gillard's office in relation to Tony Abbott's whereabouts uh, in terms of uh, where, when he was dining out, uh, when, when there was that riot that broke out. Just take us through that for the sake of viewers that didn't see the splash on the front page of the West Australian today, uh, which we've got up on screen at the moment, Mr McGowan. Uh, what, what, what's this all about? 
Look, it, it is a little bit disappointing. I, I assume this role. I understand uh, that I have to be positive and have a positive alternative and a, a fresh and sunny approach, and that's what I want to do. Uh, what's happened is uh, the Premier's office has put out emails to journalists with photographs or attaching photographs of my house with disparaging comments about it. Uh, they put out uh, some... Uh, false uh, text messages and advice in relation to my location on various occasions, so much so that I had to uh, get my kids on the line to journalists to prove that I was at home feeding my children rather, rather than at a pub drinking. That sort of thing is disappointing, uh, but I'd rather the Premier and his office focus on issues that actually matter to people. There's lots of issues out there that matter to people. Well, t- take us through some of those sort of... in the context of WA in particular. I mean, I know that shopping hours, trading on weekends and on Sundays in particular is one of them. There are others as well. What are, what are these state issues that we probably don't hear about that much outside of Perth and outside of WA uh, that, that you're either looking to change Labor policy on or looking to take on uh, the coalition in relation to? Big issues in this state are everyone's sharing the success the state has to offer. As everyone in the eastern states knows, Western Australia is a successful place. But there's lots of people still doing it tough. Some people get good money. A lot of people do it tough. You've got to have government policy directed towards making sure as many people benefit from our success as possible. Uh, I announced as well the other day a change in our trading hours policy. We're now going to be supportive of Sunday trading before the next election, which is a different approach to the one Mr Barnett was going to adopt. We'd like to see a few protections in there for retail workers as well. Uh, In relation to uh, economic reform, I put on the agenda I want to be someone who supports economic reform even in opposition, which is highly unusual. Uh, But I want to put it on record, I'll be out there arguing for economic improvement in Western Australia. Less red tape, more competition, less bureaucracy issues such as that. I'm a supporter of a beautiful environment. This state is one of the most pristine places in the world. We need to support that. And also a supporter of local jobs, uh, getting as much... So, so sorry, you, sorry, sorry to interrupt, Mr McGowan, but if you could pick one issue that you think is the biggest differentiating issue between you and Mr Barnett, what would it be? It would be focusing on the cost of living in Western Australia and trying to alleviate the burden on families in this state. But how do you do that? I mean, that, that, that's, that's nice in theory, but in practice, what are the actual ways that you, that you help people with cost of living? I know that electricity prices have risen dramatically in Western Australia recently, but the argument, of course, is that there was no choice but to do that. How do you actually have a, a strong policy impact on cost of living? Well, our record was clear. I was a minister in the government. We kept electricity, electricity prices down for families. I was a minister in the government to provide payments to uh, people with kids in their last years of schooling to assist them uh, with schooling. Both of those things have been unwound by Mr Barnett. Uh, debt has blown out enormously, so there are economic problems in this state. But our record is clear. Those sorts of initiatives, that sort of approach is what is important to me. So just to broaden this out before we let you go, Mr McGowan, in relation to the Labor Party, I mean, are, are you in a faction? Or do you see yourself as a long-term Labor insider? I know you've been in the Parliament for 15 years. Or do you see yourself as sort of a, an outsider coming in, if you like, that stays non-factional? Where, where do you sit? Well, my position is I'm not a member of a faction, uh, but I am a strong supporter of Labor. Uh, I've been a member of the party for most of my adult life, in fact, my whole adult life. Uh, I was brought up in a Labor family. I support the ideals, equality of opportunity, freedom, justice for all, a fair go for all. They're all the things I believe in, uh, but I'm not really uh, what you call a factional player or number cruncher or any of those sorts of things. Okay, and final question. Be honest with me. Would you like to see the federal election happen before your state election? Come on, be honest. Uh, well, obviously, uh, that's a matter for them. Uh, and uh, you might want me to answer that question, but I'll leave that to... Uh, on, I'll, I'll leave that to... Uh, I'll, I'll, ver- I think techni- I'll, I'll verbal Peter, I think you on that one. I'll, ver- I'll verbal you on that one. You, I think there's you, some technical difficulties you, going on here. You, you will pray morning, noon and night that Julia Gillard goes to an election so that some of the bile that voters are feeling towards her is out of the way before you go to the polls. Good luck in that. Look, Mr. I'm Mr. not McGowan. sure I can hear you there, Peter. There's trouble. There's <laughs> okay, trouble yeah, this there's end. audio problems. Mr McGowan, Labor leader, new Labor leader in WA. We're Appreciate you joining us on Showdown. Thanks for your company. Thank you. When we come back from the break, we'll be speaking to Warren Mundine, the former Labor Party president and well-known Aboriginal leader, about a range of issues, not least, obviously, events in federal politics relating to some of those riots coming out of Canberra. Back in a moment. 
Welcome back. This is Showdown, and I'm joined now by well-known Aboriginal leader and former president of the ALP federally, Warren Mundine. Mr Mundine, thanks for your company. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a tweet came in uh, when I went to the ad break, and I said one of the things I'd talk to you about would be the riots out of Canberra. And I must say, as I said it, that was not the word I was searching for. And a tweet has come in saying, riots, question mark, FFS, which I think we all know what that means. But basically, why are you calling this a riot? And, and there was clearly a lot of fracker, yeah. uh, a lot going on. But do you think that... Why, why is this being termed a riot? Do you think that this is sort of deliberate attempts to sensationalise? Well, that, that, could be the, that could be the case. But the, the reality is that it, it wasn't a riot. It was, a, it was a, a lot of violent activity in that. And quite frankly, a lot of stupid behaviour that, that happened over, over something that was a, was a nothing anyway. What, what, this whole issue of the, the, the Aboriginal tent embassy that sits outside the old Parliament House. Now, uh, Tony Abbott uh, said that they should move on, talking about the issue. Uh, the suggestion was that that was interpreted that the, that the tent embassy should be removed, yeah. and he denied that that was the case. Um, Bob Carr came out and said, well, actually, he thinks it should be removed, essentially. Uh, what, what is your view about that particular issue of, 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 of the, the ongoing positioning of the 10 embassy because it seems like there are quite a few people that that either if they don't think that the that the whole thing should be removed altogether they think like tony abbott uh, that the, the debate needs to move on if you like well there's a couple of issues there one one of course is the actual physical uh tent embassy uh now the 10 embassy is a very historical site because quite frankly back in 1972 when it was set up there was a lot of issues that that, that confronted aboriginal people we lived on the fringe there were still laws that uh discriminated against us and that in education and where you could in hospitals in townships around australia and you even the right to vote and that still was issues that were carrying on right into the 70s so the hot, i thought the people who set up the 10 embassy were very clever very smart and even the name embassy uh, given the reflection that aboriginal people mm. were strangers in their own in their own company country but, but, but there's a lot, i mean there's those those issues have been dealt with and i'm not downplaying the significance of everything else that has to be done but is Abbott right that it is time to maybe move on? Well, the point I'm trying to get to is that that's why it should be preserved as a memorial, as a historical site, like many historical sites around Australia. Uh, the issues that, uh, that, uh, that affected us in those days, we have to move on. The real issues we've got to deal with today are really about economic issues, about how we move into the mainstream Australian economy and the global economy, because 70% of mining that happens in Australia happens on Aboriginal land. How does that benefit Aboriginal people? How does that get us into intergenerational benefits as well into the future? The issues of education, the issues of health, these are the issues that we should be struggling and, and debating and, and having conversations about, not talking about issues that were 40 years ago and out of date. Abbott was right. You look at his comments, they were very benign, they were very um, harmless. I think that you know, the, the, the people who caused the violence in, in Canberra were very thin-skinned uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and they just went off their head. I, I, you know, I condemn it and everyone knows my comments, I thought it was a disgrace. The, other day, the, the second day where you had children, quite frankly, young children burning the Australian flag and spitting on it, I don't care whether you it's your flag or it's not your flag or you respect it or not. The idea that children behaving in this way is, is a total disgrace. I think, I think people need to move away from that. they really got to confront the issues that wider Australia has been confronting for the last 20 years. And there's a lot of issues that we've been confronting. You look at the, the employment issues that are happening in Aboriginal, uh, Aboriginal communities. You're looking at mining companies. Now, mining companies have 5% Aboriginal employment at the moment. They're moving into 9% very quickly. You're looking at the wider Australian community, banks, other com uh, 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 Woolworths, mo uh, Coles, or, they've got Aboriginal employment programs. You look at the money that's been spent on education at the moment. Each year, Australia spends, as a country, $10 billion on Aboriginal people. We need to, you know, I'm not saying everything is perfect, but what we've got to do is make sure that dollar... Taxpayer need to make that dollar and gets the bang for the buck. So, do you think that the spend is high enough each year, um, but it just needs to be better refined, or do you think that more needs to be done? How do you feel about uh, the, how the government's gone in this policy area since it's been elected? Well, look, uh, there's two, two, two answers. One is that the, that the money's fine. In Aboriginal affairs, there's no, there's no problem for money. You know, $10 billion is a lot of money. Then you add on top of that the state and territories, and you add on that the private industries and, and the charities that put money in. So, so the, it's, it's about the bang for the dollar. I think the most important thing this government, come in, when it came into power in 2007, was the complete focus, shifting the focus on welfare and putting it on economic management, economic development. You know, I don't know any race of people in the world or any culture or whatever 
who ever got out of poverty ever, uh, without having an economy. And we need to move Indigenous people in Australia into the wider Australian economy, and we need to move onto the global stage. Tony Abbott today in his press club speech noted that he would be spending a week each year living in remote Aboriginal communities if he's elected Prime Minister. How do you respond to that? Well, I think it's good on him. You know, Tony, uh, it's great that he does it. You know, I'm in the Aboriginal communities quite a lot more than a week. But it's great to see that he's committed to that because, you know, we do need to have our leaders and our advisors and that understanding the situation that Aboriginal people live in on a day-to-day -day basis. So I just say congratulations. Is it important, though, that he varies it up because there are some pretty different views to what policy approaches should be taken to deal with Indigenous issues, whether you're talking about some of the views coming out of Aboriginal communities in Alice Springs or, or up in Cape York with Noel Pearson. Now, is it important that, that Tony Abbott, if he's sincere in this, that he varies it up, if you like, uh, in these very competing policy spaces for how to approach Aboriginal issues? Well, one of the biggest problems in the, in the policy area of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people is that everyone, everyone thinks we're all the same. It has to be regionalised. Even in, in, in interstate within, uh, with, with communities are different. You know, people in the north coast are different to the, in New South Wales to the people in the western, western areas of New South Wales. People in the Cape are different to the people in southwest Queensland. People in Western Australia, the Pilbara and, and the Kimberleys yeah. are different again. So we need to start doing that regionalisation focusing on that regionalisation and the differing uh, competitive ma natures of those areas. I guess what I'm asking, though, is would you be disappointed if Tony Abbott's definition of spending uh, a week each year living in a remote community was essentially the same community uh, or the same ideological approach to, yeah. to solving Aboriginal issues? Well, I think it would be a waste of time. I think he has to go to different places. If he wants to spend a week up the Cape, that's great. He needs to spend a week in, in Western Sydney at Mount Druitt, largest Aboriginal population in Australia. It's tremendous problems they have there, which is just as bad as what the Cape is, then he needs to spend a week living in the Kimberleys, then he needs to spend a week in the Central Australia. Fair enough. Final question, if I can, Warren Mundine. The, the, the issue of, of Aboriginal affairs is something that um, both sides of politics have elevated the significance of it in, in, in recent years in particular. Now, what, what, I, what I want to ask you is, how long do you think it's going to take before we get to a position uh, where... Australia looks at something like a genuine treaty to try to get to a point where, where we can stop debating around the edges and disagreeing about ideological approaches on how to solve problems, but rather get to a position where, the, as you mentioned, the, the, the not at all homogenous Indigenous community is able to feel finally, after all this time, uh, that they've got a government, hopefully bipartisan, uh, moving towards something that can, that can end the ongoing concern uh, about being marginalised in the Australian community. Well, that's the sad thing about what happened in, in Canberra last week. The idea of a treaty, which is what that group is about, it, it, putting up the debate about a treaty and, and resolving a number of issues within that area, the sovereignty issues and so on, it's, about, it's not about uh, you know, where one leader got up and said, you know, we need to push the, the white people back in the sea. The vast majority of Aboriginals know what happened. We know there's 22 million other Australians here. We want to be part of that. We want you to be part of that. We want to share the same history that we've got for over the 200 years, but the 40,000 years or more. And, and, a, and a treaty process is an important part of that. I'm a supporter of it. Uh, it, was, uh, it was unfortunate that people reacted last week in that violent way when there's no such call for it to happen. Do you think it put happen? the cause back? Do you, I mean, do you think that set back the cause for winning community support for addressing Aboriginal issues because of the scenes that, that came out of it? I think it was uh, just a hiccup, quite frankly. I think, uh, you know, if it would have happened 10, 20 years ago, yes, it would have been a big issue. I think a lot of Australians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous, have really moved on. And they're focusing on the real issues and about what can we do. Yes, Yes, we know a treaty is not going to be that panacea of solving all the problems. We have to do the economic stuff as well and the education and health and so on and move forward. But it all comes together and it all works together. I think it, you know, it, you know, we'll get, uh, over the next few weeks we'll get over this issue of what happened in Canberra. We've got to also put, keep in mind that they were very much a minority of a minority. You know, there's half a million Aboriginals in Australia and Torres Strait Islanders. How many people were at the demonstration, quite frankly? Uh, we need to be focusing on the vast majority of Australians and moving forward. All right. Warren Mundine, former Labor Party president, well-known Aboriginal leader. We appreciate you joining us on Showdown. Thanks Thank for your company. You. Thank you for having us. When we come back from the break, an interview that I did a little earlier with Shadow Assistant Treasurer Matthias Corman. You're watching Showdown.
Welcome back. You're watching Showdown. Well, so far we've traversed state and federal political issues, and you can bet we'll get into some of those federal issues again uh, in the discussion that I had a little earlier with Senator Matthias Cormann, the Assistant Shadow Treasurer. But we also started by discussing the global economy. There's a concern about global contagion. There's the reality there about what impact the events in Europe and the US and so forth could have on the Australian economy. That's what I started by asking the Senator about. Well, the global economy does uh, remain uh, very fragile, which is why it is important uh, for the Gillard government uh, to get its uh, budget house in order. Uh, over the last uh, 12 months, uh, the deficit for this financial year has more than tripled from 12.3 billion uh, to 37.1 billion. And of course, if you look at the IMF uh, data, it points to uh, the need for governments across uh, the world to start paying down debt to reduce deficits and of course at the same time uh, the Gillard government uh, continues to rack up more and more debt. We've had $167 billion of uh, accumulated deficits uh, over the last four years under four uh, Labour budgets and that's of course uh, a very concerning uh, way to go and, and, and really the government is taking us in the wrong direction. Has Australia got anything, in your opinion, that we can, in a sense, teach these struggling sectors in the global economy, whether it's Europe or the United States, the miracle economy that is Australia? Is there anything that we can impart onto them to try to help them along the way? Well, I don't think that the uh, Gillard Labor government can teach the world anything. I mean, essentially what the Labor government has been doing over the last four years uh, is stride off uh, the strong performance of the Howard uh, Costello years. I mean, under the Howard, uh, in the Howard Costello era, uh, the government uh, paid off debt and delivered uh, genuine budget surpluses. And, of course, uh, that is what has uh, insulated us against uh, the worst fallouts of uh, the uh, initial uh, global financial crisis. Uh, and of course, ever since Labor has got into government again in uh, 2007, uh, we had deficit after deficit. And, and so this, this government uh, really uh, hasn't got anything to teach the rest of the world. Uh, I mean, uh, in, in terms of the situation in Europe, uh, the markets start sort of showing some signs uh, that, that, that they're becoming a little bit less pessimistic about uh, the potential for a sovereign, sovereign um, debt uh, f uh, repayment failure. So, I mean, look, certainly the uh, global economic circumstances do remain fragile, and this is, of course, the worst possible time uh, for the government uh, to pursue uh, the world's largest carbon tax, which will make Australia less competitive internationally, and it's the worst possible time uh, for the government to pursue the job-destroying uh, mining tax, which it wants to come into effect on 1 July. Speaking of worst possible times, completely separate debate at the moment. As you'd obviously well know, the Gillard government has got its problems with the security protocol that was breached by a, a leak out of the Prime Minister's office. It cost the gentleman his job. What do you actually want as an opposition, however, out of your calls for a federal police investigation into this? Isn't it enough for you just to sit back and realise that this is a terrible look for the government? Punters probably aren't impressed about it. There's political advantage for you if you just sit back and do nothing. Well, I mean, this is not about, uh, you know, what will help us politically or not. This is, I mean, this was a pretty uh, serious uh, security incident that, as it turns out, uh, was originated in the Prime Minister's own office. And the Prime Minister does have uh, a lot of questions to answer on uh, who did what, uh, when and why, uh, who knew what, uh, when and why, when did the Prime Minister find out about the involvement of her office. I mean, it is quite inconceivable. Uh, that uh, a junior staffer in the Prime Minister's office would go off on a frolic of his own uh, without first consulting with senior staffers in her office. So there are a lot of unanswered uh, questions here. Fundamentally, though, the problem with the Gillard government uh, from the Prime Minister down is that they have a pathological obsession uh, with Tony Abbott. Uh, they're, they're so obsessed uh, with coming up with uh, new uh, ways to tear down Tony Abbott that they completely forget what they're actually there for. They're there to provide good government uh, for Australia. They're there to act in the public interest, not to continue uh, relentlessly uh, to pursue uh, these political attacks and these grubby uh, little political um, sort of arrangements. When are we going to see the opposition switch to some more positive offerings? Now, it's not just me saying this, it's not rabble-rousing. Paul Kelly, Dennis Shanahan, they've all wondered whether 2012 will be a year that the opposition removes itself from pure relentless attack on the government to offer something more positive. Christopher Pine, when he appeared on Australian Agenda, was asked about this. When, he, when is this going to happen? When will we see you start rolling out policies this year, given that you're calling for an election as soon as possible? 
Well, we have already put a lot of uh, positive offerings out on the table, of course, over, over the last uh, four years in opposition. And, 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 I mean, that will accelerate in the lead-up to the next election. There's no doubt about that. But, I mean, you say the government is so far gone. Well, no. I mean, the government is the government. And, and for as long as the government is the government, we do have a job to do uh, to hold the government to account, to, to expose its failings, and, 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 of course, to scrutinize uh, the activities of the government. And that, that's, that's what we're doing, and we'll continue to do that job until uh, the government is no longer uh, the government. But of course, as we approach the next election, uh, we will be uh, putting forward our positive alternative plans and uh, people across Australia will have uh, ample opportunity uh, to scrutinise what we're putting on the table because uh, we know that there is a better way than what we're getting from this current uh, disastrous Labor administration. That was Shadow Assistant Treasurer Senator Matthias Cormann, who I spoke to a little earlier. Well, I know I played this out on Australian Agenda if you watch that on Sunday morning, and I know it's been played a few other times as well, but how can we not play out again? And I think Paul Murray played it too in one of his shows, but how can we not play out again? Uh, good old Anthony Albanese and his plagiarism of the American president, Michael Douglas. The difference is, is at least Michael Douglas, you can tell he's an actor. Albo needs to work on his acting skills. Not a lot of inspiration in the way that he delivered the lines that were already delivered by the American president. Take a look. And we need serious people to solve them. Unfortunately, Tony Abbott is not the least bit interested in fixing anything. He's only interested in two things, making Australians afraid of it and telling them who's to blame for it. We have serious problems to solve and we need serious people to solve them. And whatever your particular problem is, I promise you, Bob Rumson is not the least bit interested in solving it. He is interested in two things and two things only, making you afraid of it and telling you who's to blame for it. Well, there you go. The American president lines from quite a few years back, echoed by Anthony Albanese. The only thing is, though, he was a pretty good sport about it when he realised he called a press conference and he started using deliberately other lines, including Jack Nicholson, out of, uh, out of a few good men and so forth. But anyway, that's that. The big issue of the day, really, apart from the ongoing issues with Kevin Rudd, Simon Crean, Kathy Jackson, is the opinion polls. We had a Galaxy poll out yesterday. We had a news poll join it today and the numbers are not good for the government. No one really should be that surprised. Starting with the primary vote, these are going to come up on screen now. We've got 30% for the Labor Party. Now that's down slightly but that's within the margin of error. The Liberal Party is up at 45%. Now the only thing that's interesting about this particular figure that I really want to kind of highlight here is that Labor's very concerned about its 30% primary vote as it should be. The Liberal Party on that figure roughly on that figure, did not manage to win the last election. Uh, it, it actually lost to a minority status for the Labor Party. So what's happening here is a lot of people are going into the other column and preferences from that other column are then being distributed back to the coalition. And we see that when we look at the two-party vote. On the two-party vote, the Liberal Party, the coalition indeed, are ahead 54 to 46. Now, that's an electoral annihilation right there. But the thing, the one thing, the one shining light for the Labor Party would be that even though its primary vote is low, it is not translating as much into a fillip for the Liberal Party's vote in terms of its primary vote. It's still sitting roughly where it was at an election losing level from the 2010 election. So a lot of voters uh, are very concerned, very upset, unimpressed with the government. Uh, they're registering that as a protest vote on preferences back to the coalition. However, who knows? Maybe time will be on Labor's side, although they'll have to do a better job of it than they did at the start of this particular year with uh, some of the problems that they've had, including the backflip on the pokies with Andrew Wilkie. The last number I want to show you is the better Prime Minister figure. Now, on the better Prime Minister figure, you can see Julia Gillard has gone backwards as preferred PM. She's still ahead of Tony Abbott, but incumbents usually are ahead of their opposites because they've obviously got the added advantage of having actually served time in the role. Tony Abbott hasn't done that, but he's close. He's closer than an incumbent would really like uh, an opposition leader to be. Uh, and when we think about the Galaxy numbers that were out yesterday, it showed quite clearly that in terms of voter perceptions, they prefer Kevin Rudd almost at a rate of two to one over Julia Gillard as their leader. But when you break that down, that's a lot of coalition voters that are saying that Labor voters are roughly 50-50 in their preference between the current Prime Minister and the former Prime Minister who is working for her as her foreign affairs spokesperson.
That's all we've got time for on this issue of Showdown. It'll be interesting to see where we're at next week. When we come back, it'll be just before the return of Parliament. And you can bet that issues are going to hot up and continue to hot up around some policy finally. We've been talking about the cut and thrust of political movements with the loss of Tony Hodges' job with some of what he did the other week. When we come back, we're going to try to focus in on policy. I want to see where we're at with the mining tax, the carbon tax, and who knows, maybe we will end up with some policy development on the coalition side. Don't hold your breath, though. I'm Peter Van Onsen. Thanks for joining us on Showdown. See you again next week.